Wow. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to the 158th Landon Lecture on Public Affairs. My name is April Mason and I have the distinct pleasure uh, to serve as the Provost and Senior Vice President here at Kansas State University and I am truly delighted to be here with you today. The Landon Lecture uh, lectures were begun in 1966 uh, by the late Governor Alf Landon and the late Kansas State University James McCain, the President James McCain. The goal of the Landon Lectures is to bring the most prominent public figures to Kansas State University to discuss the issues of the day. We are very pleased today to welcome Associate Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor as the Landon Lecture speaker. The Justice joins 158 previous Landon speakers in bringing their thoughts and opinions on important public issues. Now before I introduce our Justice, I'd like to introduce distinguished guests that are here in our audience this afternoon. Would each of our guests stand as I say their name and remain standing until I've uh, introduced all? And then that, may I ask the audience uh, to hold their applause until all have been introduced. From our Kansas State Board of Regents, Regent Janie Perkins, Regent Dan Likens, Regent Mildred Edwards, and Regent Christine Downey Schmidt. The chairs of the Land and Lecture Committees, Mr. Edward Seaton, Chair of the Land and Patrons and Editor in Chief and Publisher of the Manhattan Mercury, and Dr. Jackie Hartman, Chair of the Land and Lecture Series and Director of Community Relations for Kansas State University. From our university leadership, Dr. Betsy Cobble, President of the Faculty Senate and Associate Professor of Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work. Ms. Becky Bonnenblust, President of the Classified Senate. Would you recognize these leaders with me? Especially thanks to our Regents members for being with here, us this afternoon. I'd like to welcome you here to the Kansas State University Union Forum Hall. And I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us from the Little Theater, uh, the Town Hall, as well as many friends of Kansas State University who are watching uh, via streaming video. Today's event will be different from previous land and lecture formats. We'll use a forum format today where questions will be asked and answered. Students, faculty, staff, and friends of Kansas State University were asked to submit questions that will be posed during our forum this afternoon. We're honored to have questioners, and I'm asking them to come now to the stage as I introduce them. Danny Unruh, Kansas State University student body president and senior in political science. We also have two distinguished judges to serve as questioners. Judge Danelle Taha is a U.S. District Court judge. We welcome Judge Taha. And, ja and Judge John Lundstrom is a U.S. Circuit Court judge. Please help me welcome uh, these individuals. Now it is truly my pleasure to introduce our honored guest. And as I was walking out here, she said, would you please tell them why we're running a little late? Yes, I will. If you have turned the radio on or listened to any news report, you know that the eastern seaboard is pretty much blanketed in snow. If you have just joined us from our Martin Luther King Jr. celebration event, one of our speakers was unable to get here. but. Our justice did get here. She just got here. <laughs> and if the very quick introduction we were able to have backstage is any indication, she had quite a trip. Um, she had no electricity this morning. Uh, she did have hot water. She is clean and, and freshly showered. <laughs> 
Um, but I, I am challenged to think about putting on makeup, et cetera, without any ed- electricity to help. But let me very seriously tell you about our honored guest. President Barack Obama nominated Justice Sotomayor to the Supreme Court in May of 2009. She was sworn in August 9th, 2009. Justice Sotomayor earned a bachelor's degree in 1976 from Princeton University, graduating summa cum laude and receiving the university's highest academic honor. In 1979, She earned her law degree from Yale Law School, where she served as an editor in the Yale Law Journal. She served as assistant district attorney in the New York District Attorney's Office from 1979 to 1985. She then litigated international commercial matters in New York City at Pavia and Harcourt. She served there as an associate and then partner from 1984 until 1992. In 1991, President George H.W. Bush nominated her to the U.S. District Court, Southern District of New York, and she served in that role from 1992 until 1998. She served as a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit from 1998 to 2009. Please help me to extend a warm Kansas State University welcome to the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, Sotomayor, Justice of the United States Supreme Court. It's been 18 years since I've been on this side of the bench. (laughs) (laughs) Justice Sotomayor refers to how we sit in seniority in in the Courts of Appeals and now in her court. So she's on exactly the right side today, I would say. (laughs) Justice Sotomayor, we want to welcome you to Kansas and thank you for that warm K-State welcome, even for some of us that are a bit foreign, but not that much. Uh, We're so thrilled you're with us, and uh, it was gratifying for Judge Lungstrom and Danny and me to receive uh, the proposed questions that so many students and faculty and staff people uh, were able to submit. So we've sort of tried to cull those down a bit, but I think as you get to know Justice Sotomayor, you'll see that her warm and outgoing personality may mean we may not get through quite all the questions we even plan to get through. But let me start, Justice Sotomayor, and say, you know, a lot of people out in the public hear about the decisions of the United States Supreme Court, but I suspect few know what your day is like. Would you just describe for us the sort of typical day for you, and what do you do as a justice (laughs) of the United States Supreme Court? I read a lot. (laughs) I read all day long. I read cert petitions, bench memos. Cert petitions, for those who are not lawyers in the audience, are requests by parties for us to hear a case. And they submit briefs explaining to us why we should. Our clerks, in a uh, part of a pool, prepare a bench memo analyzing the claim, telling us what the state of the law is, and we then, at a conference that we hold once a week on Friday, review the cert petitions that have come in and decide which of those cases we're going to actually hear for oral argument. We have about 5,000 to 5,500 petitions a year, and every one of them, with the exception of a handful that get dismiss for procedural reasons. Every one of those is considered by all nine justices and voted upon. That is actually a good part of my work every week. I spend um, a good portion of every weekend reviewing cert petitions. Um, The rest of the time, I'm reading parties' briefs, I'm reading amici briefs, I'm reading um, the opinions and memos of my colleagues. Um, 
firing off responses to them. Uh, if you think that making decisions among nine people is easy, remember what you go through at home when you want to decide what movie to go to. <laughs> <laughs> so make the issues a bit more complicated, and you have to understand that every time an opinion is drafted, there's a whole lot of back and forth among the justices about even small words uh, and a lot of big thoughts, but um, everything is reviewed very, very carefully before it's issued. And then I draft and edit opinions, and whether they are majority opinions, concurring opinions, or dissents, each one is a major undertaking. And so the days are mixed with lots of different activities vis-a-vis -vis the work. That's the core of our work. And then there's a part of my work that I didn't appreciate as fully as I thought when I took the job. And that's the education part of our work. Uh, I always knew, both as a district and circuit court judge, and undertook in both roles to interact with the public because I'm a very, very firm believer that lawyers and judges have an obligation to educate about both what we do, about the law, and about our democracy generally. And so I've always spent time with student groups. Well, that's continued, but imagine that when I was a judge in New York, the groups I saw were all just New York groups. <laughs> And I thought, okay, now I'm going to see groups from across the country. So how far can they come from? Well, they come from everywhere. But they also come from around the world. Uh, almost on a daily basis, although I try one day a week not to meet with groups so that I can actually concentrate. That's my day for opinion writing, and I don't like being interrupted. But generally, four times a week, I'm meeting with groups, whether they're lawyer groups, student groups. I've met with second graders. I've met with children from special needs classes and spent time talking to them. I've met with senior citizens. I've met with veterans groups. Um, I have met, you name a group, and they come visit our court. And to the extent that I can, I visit with as many as I, groups as I can, but it could become a full-time job. So you do try to limit a little bit of that. But we also have visitors, that official visitors from around the world. I've met with presidents of countries who have come to visit and just talk. We've met with the, um, uh, with the UN Secretary. We have met with judges, Supreme Court judges, judges and justices from around the world. So the educational component of the work is very, very significant. That's the day of a justice. And as my mother said, um, one, my first day back uh, visiting her after my appointment, for some reason I thought you'd be reading less. You're reading more. Um, <laughs> it's sort of the day in the life of a judge. Read, read, and read. Read, exactly. Justice Sotomayor, on behalf of the 23,000 plus students at Kansas State, welcome to campus. We're very glad to have you here. Uh, as a group of people that are going to be entering the workforce and starting careers, I'd like to ask, what was the most defining moment that directed your career in your opinion? <sighs> Danny, I, don't, I can't tell you that there was one second, one moment, one event that actually said, um, this is going to define my career. But it was a sequence of events, and each of them sort of culminating in the moment I stood before the president when he nominated me um, as his candidate for the Supreme Court. I've often been asked, um, did I really believe it was going to happen? And my answer often is, you may have dreams of things, but you don't really believe they're going to happen, do you? How many of you um, have been, you know, ace pitchers on a major league team? <laughs> How many of us have dreamt about being president at some point in your life? How many have seen themselves up on a big screen? And yes, some people do achieve those roles, but I think most of us, myself in particular, um, I wanted to be a lawyer when I was 
10, nine and a half, 10 years old. And my reasons were very simple and really uninformed and a little Pollyannic. But as I developed and I got older, those feelings have really never left me. I love the law. I love the profession of lawyering and I adore being a judge and particularly now being a justice. <laughs> but the moments for me were at nine and a half when I realized that as a diabetic that I couldn't be Nancy Drew, a detective. <laughs> I had to figure out what I could do instead and I saw Perry Mason one night. <laughs> and for the youngsters in the room, which is probably everybody under the age of 30 in this room, <laughs> Um, Perry Mason was one of the first, if not the first, television shows about lawyering. And Perry Mason uh, tried criminal cases. And uh, there was a big discussion at my confirmation hearing, and I turned out to be right. There was one, one case that he lost at trial. He lost at trial a couple of others, but he won on appeal. But there was only one case he lost. <laughs> But Perry Mason spent the first half of the show investigating the crime. And the second half was a courtroom scene. And at nine and a half, I looked at what he was doing and I said, gee, I could be an investigator as a lawyer, just like Nancy Drew. So that's what I want to be. And I then continued watching Perry Mason. And in one episode, the, after Perry had won yes, yet again, he met up with the prosecutor at a restaurant and said to the prosecutor that he recognized how much work the prosecutor had put into the case and that although he, Perry, was very happy that his client was proven innocent, that he understood that it could be disappointing to the prosecutor. And the prosecutor looked at him and said, Perry, you don't understand. It's my job to do justice. And justice to me means that those who are guilty are convicted and those who are innocent are set free. And that has stayed with me my entire life. I am just a justice of the Supreme Court some of you who are in law school are going to read about how simplistic that idea is, and it is, but it still inspires me. Not letting innocent people go free or convicting people. I'm actually not doing that anymore. I'm not a trial judge. I'm not a prosecutor anymore. But I am enforcing the rule of law. And so that sequence of events was really what set me on my path. And then each moment that came after in which I made career choices, including when I graduated from law school, it wasn't a foregone conclusion I was going to be a prosecutor. I had a fortuitous meeting with Bob Morgenthau, the most venerable prosecutor in New York, and completely by accident met him at a conference. And he, we stood next to each other, had a conversation, and he said to me, come interview with me tomorrow. I was going to the State Department. And instead, I went to interview with him, and to make a long story short, he offered me a job, and I went a little bit with my intuition and took the job. So, what are the lessons from what I'm telling you? Don't typecast yourself, and don't judge the choices you're making. Follow a passion even if that passion is not the norm. I have met accountants who actually love bookkeeping. <laughs> Why? I don't know, but I know they do. I have met stockbrokers, investment bankers, janitors, taxi drivers, people in all walks of life who actually take joy from what they do because it suits them. And I think that one of the things that people fret about is they fret about doing something that's important. I put those 
quotes and words. Sometimes the do things you do become part of history, and I've been fortunate enough to do that right now. But the reality is that most of us spend our time doing work, and it should be work that you like doing. And so you shouldn't follow the advice of others about what's right for them. You got to figure out what feels right for you and do that. My feeling about that is that in the end, if you like what you're doing, you're going to do it well and you're going to be noticed. And the taxi driver who has a fleet of passengers who take care of him or her when they're sick is getting more as much satisfaction as I am from the work I'm doing. And so that really is what I've tried to do in my life, is to figure out what I like, what makes me passionate. Thank you. You mentioned a moment ago, Justice Sotomayor, those in the crowd who are under 30, and I think there is a substantial group in the crowd who are students here at at K-State. God, pardon me. (laughs) Hello! Looking at Dan Likens with his purple jacket, how could I have ever said that? <laughs> I am so uh, my, my face is redder than my dress is sort of my own. So, uh, uh, who are uh, uh, students here at K State, and I'm sure a number of them are interested in the possibility of pursuing a legal career, and yet at the same time, there's been much written and talked about lately. Uh, concerning changes in the legal profession, about the uh, uh, burdening debt load that one often acquires in law school and job prospects becoming uh, dimmer and so forth. What can you say to the students here today about whether or not the law is an area that they should consider going into in in the face of all of these uh, obstacles that may be uh, uh, being present? Well, first of all, I'm only going to encourage you to go to law school if you actually like the study of law. Don't do it because it's a career. Um, Just as I explained earlier, a career is a career, a passion is a passion, and you should try to join the two. But assuming that the process, the method of thinking about issues that is provided by the law appeals to you, then stop worrying about making money. Um, When I graduated from law school at my my first job, I was making more money than my mother had made her entire life. Now, I gave up jobs that would have paid me four times more than the job I took. And even my mother was telling me, what are you, nuts? Uh, And... What I said to her was, I think we think about careers as financial, and they have to be on some level. You've got to work, you have to support a family, you have to educate children. But we live in a society, in my judgment, that has over big ambitions about what success means. My family was a happy one living on virtually nothing. And I don't commend that to people. I like where I am now. (laughs) But what I'm trying to say is, even if you're not going to get a job in a big law firm, there are still medium and small law firms that need you. There are government jobs, public interest jobs. They're not going to pay as much. But there's all sorts of work in the legal profession, whether it's at law schools, um, in think tanks, in a variety of different places, including newspapers who want lawyers to write articles or help check on facts, corporations who hire lawyers not just in their legal department, but as advisors to strategic thinking. There are jobs. It may be a little harder to get some of them, it's, but everyone's struggling finding work right now. In the end, if you like what, you, what the law is, you will find work. And the benefit of a law degree is you don't even have to be a lawyer. Look at how many presidents, how many senators and congresspeople, governors and mayors, politicians of all kinds have legal backgrounds. 
Look at how many business people who've never practiced a day of law went to law school because they thought it would give them some help in analytical thinking, and I believe it does. And so I start with the proposition that if it's something you want to do, remember that there's an awful lot of variety in the choices you can make, and that the only thing you have to do is be willing not to think just about money. Justice Sotomayor, uh, I think often in the rhetoric and, and perhaps abroad in society, there's a lot of concern about do judges make the law or do they interpret the law? What do we do? Oh, that's an endless conversation. <laughs> you know how much I was asked about that at my Senate hearings. <laughs> Thank you for asking it so I can give you. <laughs> it's a student's question. No, no. Um, in civil law countries, which are most of Europe, although the Europeans are moving closer to the American common law system, people in the civil law countries, the only rights you have are the ones that are explicitly stated in a statute. Because of, and I think it started the common law interpretation, not just from England, but as the framework of our Constitution, we don't approach laws generally in the civil manner. We set forth general legal principles, general statements about what Congress wants to accomplish, or the society to accomplish, the rights it wants to give, and it gives the courts the job of ensuring that the borders of whatever Congress has said in a law are understood. And I talk about borders because Congress generally passes a law thinking about one situation, but given human nature, the situations are endless that a law could apply to. And so we're being asked to take those things Congress couldn't have thought about, but that fit within the potential umbrella of a law, and define the parameters of that. It's the sort of thing like the baseball rules. The baseball rules tell you what the strike zone is, but the umpire has to use judgment about where the ball hit in that strike zone. And for those of you who have ever played umpire, you know a lot of those balls are right on the line. So did it tilt that way or this way? Um, and so for those who have see an opinion and say, gee, what are those judges thinking of? Well, what they're thinking of is what's my best interpretation of what the law means and how it applies to this situation. For some, they call, in some situations, making law, but judges don't approach the process that way. They take the tools, analytical tools they're given, the interpretive tools they're taught, and they apply them to the situation and try to come to an answer under their best view using those tools of what the law says. So I don't think that's making law, but I do think that the people who ask that question sometimes don't appreciate the complexity of what judging involves. Justice Sotomayor, you spoke earlier about the uh, large amount of reading that you do per week. What other efforts do you make continually to learn as a public judicial official um, about changing affairs in the nation? So how do you keep the pulse on what's going on? Danny, I saw this question before, and, and I've been thinking about it. And I read the newspaper. I do watch the news occasionally. I'm not a TV watcher, but I do follow the news. I think everybody who works on the internet um, goes through it constantly. So I do too. 
But the way I have virtually my entire life getting a pulse of what goes on is by just talking to people. I can't take, um, I think I got this from my mother. If you put my mother on a bench, she'll make a friend of the tree. Um, her daughter didn't fall that far from that tree. Um, I spend all my time, wherever I am, talking to whomever I meet to learn a little bit about them, what they do, what they feel about what they do, what's troubling them if they start talking to me about something that's bothering them. Sometimes they do, or what brings them joy. And for me, that's my way of staying in touch with the world. And I try to go to as many new places, including Kansas, as I humanly can, given the limits placed upon me by my job. But I also try to talk to people who do things that I don't know anything about, so I can learn a little something new. So that's how I do it. You know, you've talked about a, a number of things here that involve uh, uh, evolution and change and the way things have, have developed. One of the things that I think a number of people ask questions about uh, the law is its ability to keep up with technological change. Obviously, our Constitution uh, uh, comes from an era of, uh, so different from the one we're in today. Even much of our statutory law is, uh, by its very nature, outdated in terms of the sort of technology that was around when certain statutes were passed and so forth. How does the law keep up with this uh, evolution in technology as, uh, as we go forward? John, I think there's two components to this question. Um, the first is, how do judges stay on top of technological and scientific developments? Not so easy. Um, for any judge who's handled a patent case, a computer-related case, any of the, the, the complex technological cases, it is not easy. Um, uh, on some levels to be a judge, however, you have to have a curiosity about everything. Because that's one of the wonders of being a judge. We get to learn about every other person's life. I think of myself as a lawyer, an unwelcomed intruder <laughs> on people's lives. Unwelcome because if you're in court, you're unhappy about something that happened to you. <laughs> and I get to listen and watch what you're saying to me and learning about something that I may have no familiarity with and then try to help you resolve a problem involving that issue. So I think judges do it by just immersing themselves in the issues and learning and, and trying to understand with the help of the parties what's at stake and what the issues mean. But then there's a second component, which is the learning component in the law. And there are times that I worry about technology because of the information overload. Um, it is, and I, think, I, I don't think that that's a problem just in law. I think that's a problem generally. There's so much information and how to go through it and find that which is reliable is very, very difficult. Unlike most people, if I'm coming across something new or something that I want a quick study on, I go to Wikipedia. But you want to know something? I know Wikipedia is not a learned treatise. And yet there are some lawyers who have cited it in briefs. That's scary. <laughs> Um, uh, that's not scholarship, all right? And that's my greatest concern, not just for the law, but for the society. Can, can I follow up on that just slightly? What, what about the impact of social networking on the legal side of things, uh, tweeting or Facebook and so forth, as that relates to the way in which judges and lawyers and society interact in that context? I'm a dinosaur. I haven't done any of that. <laughs> 
Um, and I don't think any of my colleagues on the Supreme Court do. Um, and, and, and I'm probably ahead of most of them in my use of it. <laughs> I, I, I can only draft on the computer. I actually know how to navigate and surf the web. I, uh, I can't answer emails, <laughs> which some of my colleagues can't. Um, you know, so it's not that I'm behind the times generally. But the social networking has not been a part of my development, either as a lawyer or as a, uh, or as a judge. Remember, um, it was only in 1985 that I went to my law firm, and my law firm was further ahead technologically than the DA's office was, where we were still writing motions on a typewriter. Okay, And I went to my law firm, and they were still using cards to print legal briefs. For the students here, um, don't understand that the PC and even the ability to social network is not that old. It's a very recent phenomenon. We're still learning about the impact it's going to have on everything. Justice, when I went to law school, certainly, and even when you went to law school, it would have seemed very unlikely that either of us would be here in the capacity that we are. Many gains have been made in bringing diversity to all aspects of the economy and certainly to the bench. The students, however, are interested in your viewpoint about, to the extent that it's appropriate, about affirmative action and where we've come and where we might be and sort of what effect that's had on society and on the courts in specific. Affirmative action is a buzzword that bristles with many people. And uh, it, it People who have heard me use it in, in some speeches in the past, in context, have understood that I give it my meaning and not the meaning that creates the bad reactions in so many. In so many, affirmative action means quotas. And the definition of quotas is that you take unqualified people to fill a position and you bypass qualified people. When I was growing up, it was the beginning of affirmative action. And at the time, it had a very different connotation. It was a connotation in the society that there were social structures that had been built around preconceived notions that excluded women and minorities from participating fully in the society. I'll give you an example of this and the lesson I, I understood from it. When I was a DA, you started out in the lower misdemeanor court, handling petty crimes. And you eventually moved up to try felonies. And Bob Morgan thought at the time didn't move everybody up in a given year. He would move people up in waves. In the first group to be selected, there were five bureaus with rookie DAs that were selected to move up first. Four were men, and one was a woman, me. Now, when I read that, the office was half women, and I thought to myself, this is a little bit skewed. And why is this skewed? Because I had watched the women, and to me they seemed to be performing as well as the men. And I kept thinking about it, and I knew that the people that I worked with, worked with weren't consciously sexist. So what was going on? And I realized after a while that what it is, is that if all you have is male supervisors who have been very successful in prosecuting, that their image of success 
by definition, is going to be a male image. The people they're going to be most impressed by are the people like them. And they might have a slightly difficult more time seeing that the quieter woman might be just as effective, but in a different way. And in fact, that was the case because women were promoted. Some of them eventually started trying as many high profile cases as the men, and many of them became supervisors over time. Well, so what did that teach me? Or what's the lesson I took from that? And it's the lesson that I took from affirmative action and the one that I understood from affirmative action as I understood it, which was that it was a conscious choice by society to understand that the norms of selection it had set up were influenced by a system that excluded others. And by that I mean if all the people you hire are people who go to, to prep schools, and most minorities don't go to prep schools, you're not going to have any minorities in your school. So you have to sit down and say, what is it about prep schools? What do they teach and how? What is it about the students who go there and the ways in which they succeed? and translate and move out of the security of picking people from prep schools and say, I'm going to try other schools and see if they give me students of the same quality. And I went to one of those high schools. I went to a college prep high school in the Bronx, a Catholic school, but virtually nobody from my school had gone to an Ivy League school. And the first was the friend who helped me get into Princeton. I followed him. And the doors to the Ivy Leagues looking at my high school as a feeder school opened. But that was because of affirmative action. Because the school understood that its regular patterns had to be expanded. And that to me is what affirmative, the real affirmative action, making people sensitive to why they're making choices, to be thinking more broadly about the criteria and how it could be applied in, in, in different settings. And so I think we've made a huge amount of gains in that area. But I do think we still have structural problems in the society that have to be addressed before we reach full equality. And for me, the most important of those is education. We can't live in a society where the poorest children are the poorest educated. We just can't. Um, that's a structural issue that has to be addressed by the society. Because in my own community, the Hispanic community, as you know, we have the highest dropout rate of any other group than perhaps the Native Americans. Um, a lot of that can be tied to the reasons why we haven't reached an equality comparable to our presence in the population. We don't have enough college graduates. We don't have enough professionals competing for those jobs that are important in the society in terms of economic growth. And so we've come very, very far, but we still have fundamental structural issues that we have to fix before we can reach equality. Justice, what are the things you consider when deciding whether or not to grant certiorari in a case appeal to the Supreme Court? Danny, every question you ask me about what I consider, understand that I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> um, last year, um, and I tell this story freely, Justice Stevens circulated what I thought was an extraordinary tour de force opinion. And it left my mouth open. And I called him up to tell him 
I would join, but requested some changes to the opinion and, and said to him, I'm a little desperate that I can't do this. And he said to me, Sonia, I've been on the court for 40 years. What do you think? I was born a justice? <laughs> he said, you, you've got all the tools. You will, each year you're here, you'll grow. And that gave me so much comfort. And so I'm thinking about all these issues. And right now, um, I hew fairly closely to our rule about the cases one should take for certiorari, and that's Supreme Court Rule 10, which basically has three or four different criteria for taking cert. The first and the most important is that there's a circuit split. And I have actually appreciated why that is. Um, you need a circuit split. You need two courts disagreeing with each other to feel, or more than two courts to disagree with each other, to make sure that all of the best arguments on either side have been aired before the Supreme Court gets them. And the reason for that is that when the court takes a case, it takes the case in a particular factual setting. And that setting will only highlight certain consequences of the court's decision. It's always helpful to have seen what's happening in the courts below in different factual settings. So you feel some comfort that all the arguments on both sides have been raised and that you've seen enough how this issue affects different factual situations so that as you're deciding what the law means, you understand the consequences of what you're doing fully. Um, so I have understood the need for that. The second criteria is that state courts and federal courts are disagreeing. Surprisingly, that doesn't happen all that often in a pure form. State courts and circuit courts seem to divide in equal numbers around issues. But the fact that an issue may affect state courts more than federal courts can be, in some cases, an important reason to take a case where the circuits are split as opposed to when the, uh, where the states are split instead of where the circuit is split. Um, there is a question about a important federal question that requires answering. That's where the court's judgment is probably the most exercised. Because virtually every question that comes to us is important. So what's important enough to come to us in the first instance is really the nub of the matter. And that's where I think the greatest learning by me is happening. Um, because that's not as easy to define. Um, and so those are the general criteria. Um, one lesson I've learned, and this is probably less important to this group here than to a lawyer, to a pure lawyer's group, Danny, is not every case presents a question cleanly. And by that I mean what we euphemistically call vehicle problems. That there are cases that present the legal issue, but before you can reach that legal issue, there's a lot of procedural questions or other questions embedded in the case that might stop you from reaching the issue that's important. And so a lot of times it may be a terribly important case but it has a serious vehicle problem because we'll never get to the issue. We might never get to the issue. So all of those factors go into us deciding when to take certiorari. Uh, I believe I'm correct in saying that you are uh, the first justice in a long time to have served as a trial court judge as well as a court of appeals judge. Uh, do you think that that has given you any different perspective or how has that, if at all, contributed to your perspective as a, a Supreme Court Justice? I, 
I am probably um, not exclusively, but often more interested in circuit procedural splits than my colleagues might be. Uh, that, again, to the non-lawyers, if I can explain that. <laughs> I just said to you that there's substantive, meaty questions that are important and there's circuit splits around. But district court judges and circuit court judges' work is guided by, cabined by, and controlled by procedural rules which parties have to follow before a court can get to the merits of a question. And just as in all human endeavors, there's difference of opinions, there are vast difference of opinions among judges below about the procedural rules. And the consequence of that is often to create more headaches for district court judges, <laughs> more headaches for circuit court judges on how to review things. And I think, or I see myself being much more sensitive to that than most of my colleagues on a daily basis. And I can't tell you that it makes a difference, but I think it's a voice in the room when we're talking about whether to take certain cases. And I haven't actually done the study myself, but I think you may see certain kinds of procedural questions that more have been heard, and to the extent that I may have, my presence may have been made a difference on the vote on those, I think it does have an impact in the conversation. May I say on behalf of all of us that have to work with those every day, thank you very much. That's very important. Now, some of my colleagues would say I don't like clear substantive rules. Um, and that may be true sometimes, because I also like giving, you, giving the courts below a lot of flexibility on some things. Ooh, well, we thank you for that. <laughs> uh, let's turn a little bit uh, to your personal reactions to the court. What surprised you the most and uh, sort of the kind of unseen things that would surprise a new justice about the court? The thing that has surprised me the most that I did not anticipate was the burden I would feel in my decision making as a Supreme Court Justice. I had just really never thought about it. So I'd been a judge for 18 years. And when I first came to the district court, one of my colleagues who later became and is a very dear friend came to see me. and. We were talking about a judge that had left the court a little while before, and he said, you know, this judge was paralyzed with decision-making. He wasn't sleeping. He was a great lawyer, but he had to leave the bench because he just could not take the burden. And my colleague said to me, Sonia, we're human beings. The best we can do is to do our best in every case to pay close attention to the parties, to hear them, and to give the best answer we have or can do. But we can't live with regret. He said, you have to move on to the next case and help the next set of parties. Just remember, there's a court of an appeals in the Supreme Court to fix anything you do wrong. <laughs> Believe it or not, that gave me an enormous sense of security moving forward. And I always understood the responsibility of judging. But I understood what he meant about understanding that my responsibility was to, to decide the cases and let them go to the next court. There's no next court now. <laughs> and I had not anticipated how that would feel. I always paid very close attention to every to the work I did, but I find it heavier now um, in a way I had not thought about. Um, I had not clerked on the Supreme Court when I was a young lawyer, and so I didn't know what the building or the institution was like except all of those books on the Supreme Court that I had read that some of you may have read about. And the, some of the stories they tell don't really sound very nice. 
Um, as I was going through the process, one of my friends picked up the nine, which I hadn't. And she called me up because she knew I had it by my uh, bedside. She had visited me for a party. And she said, don't read the book. You'll never take the job. (laughs) I followed her advice. I was too busy to read the book. But I have been so pleasantly surprised by the collegiality among the justices. There's genuine affection among people. And there's a genuine commitment to the institution, to the court, to its history, to the work we do. And it gets translated into everybody in our building who has any job in the building. You can feel their reverence for the court. Not necessarily for us as individual justices, but for the court as an institution. And that really is a very special feeling when you go to work and you see that you're working among people who really revere what they're doing on every level. And so those things, one not as pleasant, the other more pleasant, have been my biggest surprises. Last year, Chief Justice John Roberts called the State of the Union Address a political pep rally, and recently some have called for and participated in intermingled seating of Republicans and Democrats instead of the traditional partisan seating. Justice Sotomayor, what do you think about this proposal? I'm not going to talk about the proposal. I'm going to talk about something else. (laughs) But I think I'll make my point, okay? One of my best friends is the defense attorney who tried her first criminal case against me and me my second criminal trial. And she will tell you um, and tell her, well, she told her children for years when they would ask who won the case, we would both respond, we both won, we became friends. Um, Until they got old enough to ask who really won, but... um, (laughs) Now, we were both young prosecutors. We, she was passionate about her client. I was passionate that her client should be convicted. There wasn't an ounce of work that either of us forewent on behalf of the interests that we were representing. We fought civilly, but tooth and nail in the courtroom. And we walked out and admired each other, enough to become friends. To this day, I can't tell you how many calls I get from her saying, what's wrong with you judges? (laughs) Um, She's still a criminal defense lawyer, okay? And, um, And I'll look at her and tell, and you know, we'll get into a huge fight about whatever. I learned in the practice of law, that having commitment and passion and morals and integrity and views and all of those things are important to every human being. That what helped me do my job better was that I understood that people who oppose what I was doing possess those same qualities. And I learned that if I was learned to listen to them and respect that they were coming from the same place I was, but we were coming to different conclusions, that I could do my job better. So every case, I would put myself in the shoes of the, of the defense attorney and try to figure out what they were thinking. So I could anticipate my trial strategy. But I could only do that if I really respected what their roles were. I think that there is not a conflict in disagreeing agreeably. I think people can do it. 
I think it helps us reach better solutions that way. Even when one party's views don't win out and the others do, it's a dialogue with value. It enhances the discussion. And so um, I was there at the State of the Union last year. I was there this year, personally. I loved seeing John McCain and Kerry sitting next to each other. I do. And I saw uh, people who I saw on different sides of the aisle during my hearing sitting next to each other. And it was much more pleasant for me. Other people may have different views, but I, for the reasons I said, I like agreeable disagreement. What, you got time for another? All right. Uh, we're not quite sure when they're going to pull the plug on us here. <laughs> So, so, well, I'll give, give you one more. Uh, I told Jackie I'd run over, but I don't want to bore people. So yeah. we're, we're at their disposal here. But uh, one of the questions that, that was uh, pr- proposed here, I think, is very interesting. And you've touched on a bit of this. But as you, as you see the interaction between social issues that face our country going forward and the role of the university in dealing with those, uh, how, how do you see that role as far as addressing the most important uh, social problems that you think our country faces? I think that the role of universities is to take students out of their comfort zones and introduce them to new experiences and new ideas different from the ones they came with, challenging to the ones they hold, and teaching them in areas they know nothing about. I'm a firm believer, and it's advice I gave my niece and I will give my nephews when they're ready, they're my godchildren, to go to college. Every one of them I say, become a renaissance person in college. Don't just take courses in one area. Take courses in everything they offer. You want to grow up to be an informed citizen. So even if you're going to be a graphic artist, at least understand economic theory. Even if you want to be a doctor, take a law course. It's not going to hurt you. It might even help you if you have a malpractice suit against you. I'm I'm jesting about that. But I do think that the role of institutions is to find ways to take students out of their comfort zones and expose them to more. I know the provost is going to wrap us up here, but I'd like to say a word to all of you gathered and to the justice. We are so grateful that you came during among the busiest times in the term to be with us. And I would be remiss if I did not say that she is here also on behalf of a commemoration you should all know about, which is it is the 150th anniversary of the federal courts in Kansas. It is no surprise and no accident that we will celebrate 150 years of statehood and 150 years of the federal courts this weekend because Kansas was the frontier of the rule of law at the time. And you may not know this, there were more federal district courts in Kansas during a certain period of time than there were anywhere else back in those days because of the forts that were uh, out here on this frontier. So as you thank the justice for her appearance and her participation in an extremely important weekend for the state of Kansas, I hope you'll also reflect on your part in carrying that legacy forward of the rule of law on this frontier. Thank you to Casey. State. 
Judge Taha, thank you for reminding us of a particularly important anniversary for our state. Um, I think we do need to uh, give uh, Judge Lundstrom a little bye on his uh, very quick gaffe. Um, please note, please note that both of our guests who are KU graduates are uh, appropriately addressed today. They, ca- they said they came neutral, and in fact, <laughs> Judge Lundstrom indicated that he was wearing green in commemoration of the Kanza. So I wanted to be sure to tell you that. And I, I especially cho- chose my Native American jewelry for this occasion. <laughs> Justice Sotomayor, I think that your last comments of asking that, responding, that bringing our students to places they don't know and having them learn new things and come out of their comfort zone is something that uh, I particularly resonate with. And I think that is something that Kansas State University takes very, very seriously. And you are going to have the opportunity uh, to meet a number of our students. And I hope that uh, they will ask you questions and learn from you. On behalf of the university, I want to thank you so sincerely for making time in your schedule to come here and help all of us know much more about um, something critically important um, in in our uh, our country, and that being the Supreme Court. We're delighted to add you uh, to the list of many honored Landon speakers. Would you now join me in thanking Justice Sotomayor? Thank you very much.